Oh, hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. I think we're going to make a wee start now, if that's all right. Um, if I could, like, encourage people. Everyone, I mean, I knew this would happen. Everyone's very dispersed in the, in the space. You may want to move forward a wee bit. We've kind of created a sort of, I think, with Claire and our events team, we're calling it like a sort of gentle circle for Sam. As opposed to an aggressive... <laughs> as, oppo as opposed to an aggressive tiered lecture theatre. So if you would like to move into the gentle circle, um, or move a wee bit forward if you want to, and we'll get started. Okay. Or we can stay exact, exactly where we want to stay. We can be where we want to be. No one's going to judge anyone here for that. Yeah. So I'll give folk a wee minute to felt very teacherly there. I'll give you a minute to just settle down. Um, hi everyone, my name is James. Uh, I use he, him pronouns and I am a lecturer in contemporary art theory here at uh, in the School of Art, which is part of Edinburgh College of Art for those of you who are visiting us from either other parts of the university or from the outside world. Um, so welcome to the School of Art and welcome on behalf of the Staff Pride Network, who I'm going to hand over to in a wee moment. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying like a few thanks for me, uh, this event happening. Um, first of all, from the School of Art, I just want to say thank you to our... Um, is this still on? Yeah, it's still on. Um, <laughs> it's like my voice isn't loud enough. Um, who's been very supportive of all the kind of gay things I've been doing at Edinburgh since <laughs> <laughs> since I started in January, um, which has like been such a joy. So I run a thing called Gay Club for any students in the room, um, which runs on a Wednesday at the moment. Um, and so sort of Sam's talk, this talk kind of came out of that, our kind of ongoing conversations I've been having uh, with Susan around gay things <laughs> at ECA. Um, uh, thank you to our principal, uh, Juan Cruz, who, um, has who of ECA have supported this event um, with the lovely refreshments. Uh, uh, super mega, mega thank you to Claire. I can't see Claire. Claire's, oh, Claire's right there. Uh, Claire from our events team, who's been really like wonderfully amazing to like work with on this. Um, so I've got a bit of an inverted like ribbon situation going on in here. There's nothing in distress. It's just I'm in distress. Um, yeah. So Claire's like made this event happen. It's been really like, lovely to like work um, with you and um, and all the staff in the School of Art and ECA who've been like super super supportive. Um, and really helped with like, you know, bringing Sam from London. I mean, not physically bringing you from London, but you know, like arranging everything and all the admin team and stuff like that. I'm going to hand over to the Staff Pride Network. I'm going to say a little bit of an intro and then I'll, I'll introduce you to Sam um, and stop talking so that you can hear this nice, nice talk. Um, so this is Katie. Hi. Thank you. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> I think those that applause should particularly go to James for really driving the event today um, and sort of peripherally through connection with one of our events uh, volunteers in the Staff Pride Network, Sarah, um, and to our other volunteers within the Staff Pride Network who support what we do. A huge thank you to, to, to you all for bringing this together and for shepherding people who didn't know where they were going, um, which included me as I arrived rather late, so thank you. Um, I'm Katie, I am one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, today we've partnered with James and colleagues in the School of Art um, to put on this event, and we are fundraising for a fantastic charity called Waverly Care. They are Scotland's HIV and Hepatitis C sexual health charity. Um, so if you're able to, um, we're suggesting a donation of around two pounds, but you can um, donate whatever you're able um, using the QR code up here. Uh, we'll take you to our Just Giving uh, site. Please feel free to do that in your own time and at your own discretion. Um, there's a huge amount of work that Waverly Care does in advocacy um, and 
um, and, and promoting the prevention and also reducing the stigma that surrounds HIV uh, in Scotland. And for everybody travelling to Scotland, they can access the, the advocacy support that Waverly Care does. And the Staff Pride Network have been really fortunate to have quite a long-standing partnership with them. We attend their um, business breakfasts and, and we work with their volunteers to try and promote what they do. Um, we've supported their bucket shaking during the fringe um, in num a number of years and had various opportunities to support what they do. So today at being World AIDS Day we just wanted to give them a shout out um, and if you can donate and share with your friends, put stuff on social media. Their initiative this year and you may have noticed some of us are wearing quite a bit of red, um, it's to wear red for World AIDS Day. Um, so you can, you can do that if you want um, but mainly just share it as well widely uh, as you possibly can. Um, and so thank you so much and I'm going to hand you back to James to give a proper introduction to our fantastic speaker today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and it's been really lovely working with the Staff Pride Network. Um, I, I'm not going to name drop everyone but everyone's been like so supportive when I asked I wanted to do this event. They were, uh, yeah, really like amazing to work with. And I guess thinking about um, this prompt to maybe support an organisation like Waverly Care uh, is also a sort of prompt to think about what today is, which is World AIDS Day, um, and very much an idea that a lot of activists and organisers um, would say that the, the AIDS crisis isn't over. Um, it might be elsewhere or it might exist within different communities. Um, there might be rules around advocacy, treatment and things, and that's why we're sort of pointing you towards Waverly Care as an organisation that do a lot of amazing work in this area. Um, but it is a sort of thing, important thing to pause and reflect on. So World AIDS Day is something that I've tried over the past few years to, to organise stuff around, um, not just as, as a moment of like pause and reflection. So for those of you that are maybe less familiar with the histories um, of the HIV AIDS crisis um, affected uh, the queer community, predominantly the queer community in the late 80s and uh, 1990s, early 1990s. Um, and World AIDS Day is one day to sort of reflect on that, to remember, um, but also very importantly, and this promise leads into why we've invited Sam, uh, this is a moment to think about the politics and the kind of ongoing action that artists and uh, sort of creative responses to these legacies can sort of continue them, can keep them going in the present, in this present moment. And I think a lot about this in my own work and in my own research about the ways in which we have these productive returns and that's something that Sam will talk about in their, their talk today. And I wanted to ask Sam, because over the past few years, um, sounds like a bit art historian, but there's been a lot of really interesting work done, particularly within kind of queer and trans communities around like print cultures and writing and poetry. And Sam is one such writer to sort of emerge um, within, I think, a context of writing, but also in the context of contemporary art, at sort of the spaces within which these things take place, thinking about being in an art school and why we wanted to host this event here. And um, writing and prose being a form of resistance and being a form of activism. And Sam wrote this beautiful book in 2020 called All My Teachers uh, Died of AIDS, which was published by Pilot Press, um, a very interesting uh, queer publisher that sort of championed a lot of uh, newer voices in writing and practice. So that's where the invitation began, uh, to think about how artists and writers are responding to the AIDS crisis, both as a sort of lens historically to sort of cultural fragments that we have from those that we've lost, but also imbuing that with a sense of e energy and urgency now and a, a sort of politics to that. So that's the that's the idea <laughs> behind today. And I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's going to do a much better job of talking to us. Now, this is, a, this is an artist talk, so I invited Sam to talk about, start as a starting point to think about this, this book, which was published a few years ago. Um, 
but also as a space of reflection on ideas and on practice. Um, Sam subsequently published another beautiful book called Long Live the New Flesh in 2020 with Polaris Press. Um, so whilst their practice is moving and maybe uh, developing on some of the ideas that come out of this book, this is an opportunity or this was an opportunity as I asked Sam to sort of reflect on, on, on this work but also um, perhaps inflect some of their current practice. And with that in mind, for any students in the room tomorrow, Sam's doing a, a workshop um, at 11 a.m. Some folks have signed up, but if you are interested in coming along, you can email me, okay? Um, that's at 11 a.m. and E21. So I'm going to hand over to Sam. I've got your biography here. I don't know if I should like, read it out, but I'm going to read it out because that, like that feels like the done proper thing. So Sam is a writer, artist and editor whose work inflicts a new generation of artists and creative responses to the enduring political legacies of the ongoing HIV AIDS crisis. Their work on queer culture and politics has been published um, by Freeze, The Financial Times, Hyperallergenic and in other places. And as I mentioned, the author of All My Teachers uh, Died of AIDS, Pilot Press 2020, and Long Live the New Flesh, uh, Polaris Press 2022. So if everyone can give a lovely hand to Sam, I'm going to hand it over. Thank you. Is the, okay, yeah, this sounds like it's working. Can everybody hear me? The lights off. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do lights off. Uh, let's see if I can get all the technology to work. Openings are difficult. I've been struggling with them a lot lately in trying to plan new work, a play, a novel, this. I keep returning to the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its own tail returning to returning and trying to make sense of the things that we've been left by the past as much as trying to make sense of the cause of the absence itself. The cause of the absence here is clear, the AIDS crisis and the way it lingers over queer life now as if it were a kind of schism forcing us to define time as before or after. I saw the inheritance twice in its West End run, once in September and once in December. They were giving out red ribbons for World AIDS Day at the box office, and I've still got mine now. I'm wearing it. In one of the intervals for the first of the two plays, it's consciously styled as Angels in America for a New Generation, I overheard a conversation of some older men sat a row in front of me. One was telling the other about someone he knew in the 80s who worked with an orchestra in New York. He said that the stage seemed to be shrinking every day. Years later, I'm not sure if he's talking about his own experience or something else, a historical anecdote embedded into a novel about AIDS, to the friend who did not save my life. He told me, embroidering a little, perhaps, of Haydn's farewell symphony. Haydn, who held the post of official composer at the court of Prince Esterhazy, a rather tyrannical patron, wrote his last symphony in the form of a manifesto, with the willing participation of the musicians who resented being kept on late in the season in a summer palace unsuited to frosty weather, and prevented from rejoining their families in the city by the capricious decision of Prince Esterhazy. The symphony began in full splendor using every instrument in the orchestra, whose members slowly left one by one in full view of the audience, since Haydn had written the score with the successive elimination of all the instruments, up to the very last solo, even including in the music, the breath of the musicians as they blew out the candles on their music stands, and the sound of their footsteps tiptoeing away, making the gleaming floor of the concert hall creak as they went. The farewell symphony, for both the story itself and the place where I rediscovered it, felt like a perfect title for this. It isn't just about the orchestra, but about the people in the pit, the gallery, the circle, the gods. Culture in the sense, I mean, people don't talk about it anymore, but when people did talk about it, uh, they talked about like what artists were lost, but they never talked about this audience that was lost. Uh, you know, when people talk about like, why, you know, the, why was New York City Ballet so great? Well, I mean, it was because of Balanchine and Jerry Robbins and people like that, but also that audience was so, I, I can't even think of the word, I mean, it, Suzanne Farrell wasn't like this instead of this. That was it. She could. She might as well just kill herself. There would be like a billion people who know exactly every single thing. You know, there was a, such a high level of connoisseurship. 
of everything that, 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 that people like this were interested in, you know, of everything that made the culture better. You can, you know, a very discerning audience, a very, you know, uh, an audience with a high level of connoisseurship um, is as important to the culture as artists. It's exactly as important. Now, we don't have any kind of discerning audience. When that audience died, and that audience died in five minutes, literally, I, people didn't die faster in a war. And it allowed, of course, like the third, the second, third, fourth tier to rise to the front. Because, of course, the first people who died of AIDS were the people who, I don't know how to put this, got laid a lot. Okay, now imagine who didn't get AIDS. Okay, that's who was then lauded as like the great, you know, artist. Okay, you know, if the other people that hadn't died had been alive, if they all came back to life, and I would say to them, guess who's a big star? <laughs> guess, you never, guess who has a Sean brother? Guess who's like a famous photographer? Get, you, see, wait, that would like fall on the floor. Are you kidding me? Because everyone else died. Last man standing. Okay, I mean, that had a, t that loss of that audience had a terrible effect, and a terrible effect on me. Uh, I mean, by which, not just a sad personal effect on me, but a terrible effect on me because everything has to be broader. I mean, I don't do that, you know, but everyone else did, you know. Everything has to be more blatant, more on the nose, broader, you know, because obviously they're not going to pick up little subtleties. Things in the culture that had nothing to do with the New York City ballet, you know, it just got dumbed down, dumbed down, dumbed down, all the way down. One of the reasons. There's this impulse to remember, to return to the schism like it's a wound. I run my finger along it, wondering if it will bleed again. I'm struck by how many of the writers I'm returning to have died. I wrote another essay about blood and returning and horror, with Kevin Killian's Ayo Gento series at the center of it, illness as metaphor. I didn't want this essay to be about AIDS. I'm still trying to understand why I keep returning to the topic, trying to understand the aftershocks of something that came a generation before me. I wanted this essay to be about Clive Bayorka. Some of my notes for a version of the essay included the parenthetical, this is a Clive appreciation essay now, with a desire to focus on the reclamation of monstrous queers in Cabal. A lot of queer work is about death. It had to be for a long time. Death was everywhere. The corpses change but the priority goes on forever. I'm glad that this is, in a way, about Kevin. It's an essay where I've been talking to myself a lot, but I think that fits with a lot of what his work does. It talks to itself, to the films that give the poems their titles and narratives. I'm talking to myself and to the poems because I can't talk to Kevin. In the first half of The Inheritance, protagonist Eric Glass, the everyman around whom bigger personalities swirl, goes to the house of an older friend, Walter, Walter took his friends to this house in the Ahus so that they wouldn't have to die alone. There's a cherry tree outside, loaded with metaphor and meaning, like Chekhov's orchard. The young men materialize outside, around the tree, around Eric. Walter, is that you? Um, no, but... I'm sorry. I thought you were Walter for a moment. You have his way of walking around the house. Uh, I'm Eric. Eric Glass? Yes. How did you know it's my so name? It's so nice to finally meet you. We've heard so much about you. Me? <laughs> Who are you?
Christopher. <laughs> I'm Peter. Peter? <laughs> Peter West. I'm a friend of Walter's. Welcome home, Eric. I know the clip is long, but it was too good. I don't want to cut any of it. Um, I remember, or think I remember, seeing on the walls of a secondary school history class the adage that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Sometimes you have to repeat things in order to learn, or learn things in order to repeat them, to return to them, to see them through the eyes that, to see them through eyes that are not just your own, the hands of the past gesturing towards something in between what was and what might be. The first poems I remember writing were about that space. I went through my rite of passage of writing bad poetry in my corner of the internet when I was 18, 19, 20. The one I remember most clearly was about cinema, about the camera and the projector, about that beam of light becoming something haunted that could reanimate people who were long gone. Like ghosts, they reappeared to repeat motions over and over again. The image I had in my mind for it was the end of Casablanca, the eternal refrain that we would always have Paris, which, in a way, was true. There's a scene in Persona, Bergman's 1966 masterpiece, where the projector burns, breaks. The form of the film itself literally shatters into pieces and becomes something different, abstract, surreal, vampiric. It's another schism, the first I vividly remember seeing, one I still remember now. Bergman thought soul was a red spider, I can close my eyes and visualize it in my body, beginning somewhere in my chest or my stomach, its limbs reaching along my body, some of its eight, an extension of my four. Maybe it is the soul, maybe it's history. What came before me lingering in the things that come from my body. My feet on autumn leaves in Californian suburbs, my fingers, both hands, touch typing, writing through, working out what this is and will become. My mouth saying it out loud to you now. 
Oral history was one of the first, oldest forms of literary tradition. I heard that Homer's epics were built on this. It reminds me of a feedback loop captured in a poem. I think the sirens in the Odyssey sang the Odyssey, for there is nothing more seductive, more terrible than the story of our own life, the one we do not want to hear and will do anything to listen to. I write through myself a lot, but I don't know if I'm very interested. The personal prism of the work is about the process of learning, research, the act of writing itself. In a pub in North London, I'm meeting with two friends. They're launching an independent press and we've talked about the possibility of bringing out something of mine. A book of essays cobbled together in lockdown on adult film, on fantasy and projection, on what we keep and what we remember. Sean, who edits work I do for a magazine, has decided to spearhead the editing of the manuscript, insisting now, many months later, that he's, quote, nightmare and only halfway through it. He says that I use the act of writing as a way of understanding, for myself as much as anyone else, what I think and how I came to think it. This, among other things, is an example of that. I like the sound of the words, why I write. There you have three short, unambiguous words that share a sound, and the sound they share is this. I, I, I. In many ways, writing is the act of saying I, of imposing oneself on other people, of saying, listen to me, see it my way, change your mind. I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see, and what it means. I wrote an essay, the beginning of another book I'm yet to finish, about not just what I was thinking, but what I thought. And Didion appeared, the beginning of the White Album. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. She stuck out to my writing group, her presence uncertain, jarring, like a ghost at the feast. I don't think I've written anything I like this year, that essay included. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it will let me celebrate my successes, which I'm always reminded that I'm bad at as I constantly move on to the next project. Maybe I don't need to constantly be looking to the future. Maybe I can celebrate something like this. I'm trying to make sense of this as I write it, tying myself in knots, returning to returning to the schism, to an empty space that consciously or not, we keep trying to fill. The absence isn't just in people lost, but in stories, histories, a line I keep returning to, who gets to speak and why, and how we speak, for someone, through them, those that are gone, with their visceral dispatches from the end of the world. There's a temptation to mix metaphors when it comes to the plague, where it was a schism before, now I want to call it a black hole. It sucks in everything, its absence made into something corporeal, for Sean, I'm working on a piece about the Nan Golden documentary, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. The essay hinges on the curation of witnesses against our vanishing. There are people who have vanished, although they linger like ghosts, having left us fragments on the page. I'm writing against our forgetting. There's a throwaway moment in Virology where Joe Osmondson mentions the idea of people who still write about the AIDS crisis, about the concern from an older generation people who were worried that we were beginning to forget. There is a kind of serendipity in the genesis of the work that led me here. The doors that it opened, I owe it a lot, the doors that it opened, people who it made sit up and take notice. It was about that kind of connection with the queer writing of the past and what it might look like. London's ICA, the London's ICA, my first year in London, queer writers in a group reading. It felt like a kind of communion, connection. It changed the way I wanted to write. It paved the way for the first book, the second book, the third book, for this. I'm always looking back at it, grateful that I haven't turned into salt. I try not to forget the things that have let me get here. I think I'm more fortunate than I am talented. Always in the right place at the right time. At the ICA, surrounded by strangers. I hadn't been in London for very long. I moved there in the October of 2018, and this was in November. Queers Read This, a series of readings from queer authors, a platform de designed to elevate those voices. It's co-run by Richard Porter, who will go on to publish my first book, and Isabel Weidner, who will write a blurb for it. As vast and overwhelming as it felt at the time, I'm learning for the first time just how small the world can feel. 
After the readings, I asked Dodie Bellamy to sign my copy of When the Sick Rule the World, wondering what it might mean for the title to come true. I keep thinking about other ways into writing about the plague, horrific metaphors like Kevin's, a short play I wrote about vampires that's still in limbo, waiting for a rejection. Years later, while we're in the shadow of a new plague, a sign that those things on my history class walls may have been right after all, I zoom into a class that Dodie is teaching on writing sex and death. I'm asked by 12 students in California about the book, the citations, the process. The silence that accompanies someone, anyone being asked to speak, is as pregnant as I remember, made all the more strange by the fact that this class is taking place in fragments on webcams. There are pieces of students' bedrooms behind them, beds, bookcases. I'm at, a I'm at a table in my living room, the table I'm writing this or what it will become, and behind me there's a record player and posters for two of the plays I wrote while getting my masters. Again, years later, we exchange a few more furtive emails about if Kevin's writing ever got reprinted. I asked about a paper copy for this, and I feel again that moment of connection that is so fraught, returning to make sense of an absence. She tells me that there are, or even were, plans to bring out a volume of Kevin's completed works, but that even with all going well, it wouldn't be out for a couple of years. I email the original publishers of the book just in case, but they tell me it's out of print. I scour used bookstores in London, Sacramento, San Francisco to find a copy, but I come up blank. I have a PDF of the book from the spring I sat in on Dodie's class. I'd written about an anthology of trans poetry for a magazine out on the West Coast, and David, its publisher, suggested that I get in touch with Dodie in order to get a copy of Kevin's writing. I found a piece about it while looking for writing that existed at the intersection between horror and AIDS for the essay that would end up being about blood. We emailed back and forth about Kevin, about It's a Sin, which we were both watching, and about our own literary histories. After reading Teachers, I'm still curious about your interest in that history. I love the idea of a heritage that's been erased by death, but one thing teacher friends of mine constantly complain about is how students have no sense of history, present company excluded. Perhaps this is just an American thing, the vicious ahistoricism. I was more like you, researching, looking for clues wanting to connect to a heritage. I knew my Genet, I knew my Bloomsbury group, I read my tender buttons. That was one beautiful thing about coming of age as a writer in San Francisco. The place has such an amazing literary heritage and I liked to think of myself working within the context of that heritage. I think my interest at the time came from trying to make sense of that erasure and wondering what could be made with the pieces that still remained. I don't know if I thought that my generation or the one after it lingering at the end of the alphabet a historic. I knew I wanted to fight against that a historicism if I could with whatever tools I had. The morning of the day I write these editions, I'm lying in a friend's bed in California while they sleep next to me. I'm planning a piece about personas and queerness, the creaking relic that is the movie My Policeman. I'm looking at interviews with Harry Styles where he says it was unfathomable to imagine a time in which it was legal to be gay, even though throughout the world that time hasn't passed. As I write this, the World Cup has recently kicked off in Qatar and England won their first game 6-2, and that clock is still ticking. History is not history everywhere, and the past is present more than we might care to admit. I'm bad at writing endings. It used to be that whenever I planned something, a play, an essay, my early furtive attempts at novel writing, I need to know the end before I could begin. This has become less true as time's gone on, as I've written more and I've understood more clearly what that writing is for, that it's about working things out, why I think and feel the way I do. A few days before writing the final section of this, I spent the day in Sacramento. We went for dinner with a friend from grad school and then we grabbed a cocktail before she went to an open mic night and I went to a drive-in movie. She said the event had the vibe of John Wayne does open mic and we talked about the ways in which she thinks my writing could gesture more towards Americana. She gave me notes on a John Wayne essay for the new book. She said that the thing she hates the most about writing is the moment of publication afterwards, that everyone who reads it feels like they know you, recounting the strange sympathy of a stranger in a workshop. The day after we saw each other, a quote from Jory Graham appeared on my Instagram timeline. A poem is a private story after all, no matter how apparently public, the reader is always overhearing a confession. I always wonder how much of a confession my writing is. I think I railed against it in teachers, said I had nothing to confess, nothing that required absolution. The morning I write these lines, I see a poem 
by, from Jay Hulme as the world around me, physical, digital, tries to reckon with the latest tragedy. My beautiful child, there is nothing in this heart of yours that ever needed to be healed. When I wrote the ending of Teachers, I referenced the most helpful, readily available metaphor I had within my grasp. That the existence of this book, with its citations, memories, uncertainties, was an act of standing on the shoulders of giants. Looking back and still, always afraid of turning to salt, that metaphor seems too corporeal, too solid. As much as the book was about trying to find a way through history, that history is never something that could be permanent. Here is one whose teacher's names were writ in water, in blood. So much of the book is about reckoning with the absence, more so than it's about those few physical things, books, words, ideas, all of them more fragile than we might care to admit, that try to fill in the gap. I'm not standing on anyone's shoulders because they wouldn't be able to take my weight. The question of if I'd be able to reach out and touch them at all, or if, like with so many ghosts, I would close my hand around nothing. I'm bad at writing endings. When I wrote a play in the summer, the thing we kept returning to in the rehearsal room was the end, the last few pages, the last few lines. I have a compulsion to overwrite, to add more until I find the right thing, writing into it, through it, beyond it. I wonder if that's what I'm doing here. I'm think in thinking about how to end this, I'm thinking about the opening point. The farewell symphony and all those musicians extinguishing their candles, walking off the stage, the brief echo of haunted footfalls lingering. I don't want to do that. I want to light candles instead, to offer a way forward, not just with the words of those who have come before me, but mine for whatever they might be worth. This is a picture of the Nob Hill Theatre in San Francisco. Um, I just flew in from there a couple of days ago. And my brain is still catching up. It used to be an adult film theatre, and then it was a strip club, and it's recently closed down and I write about it in the new book because it appears in some films from the 70s that are interesting and self-aware, and I think it's an interesting example of what we choose to keep as our history and the idea that something like this is somehow not worthwhile, maybe because it's not respectable enough. Um, and I've also been thinking about Angels in America and the monologue at the end of it that begins... Night, life, night flight to San Francisco. Chase the moon across America. God, it's been years since I was on a plane, bless you. And nothing's lost forever. In this world, there's a kind of painful progress, longing for what we've lost and dreaming of what's ahead. Thank you. Hello. Not that you're my Dodie Bellamy, but I was actually thinking about <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about when we were um, like having a back and forth, like organising this talk, and Sam was so super generous and like sent me a draft of it, and I was like, you've carved, you've turned like an artist talk into like prose. It's like it had, it was just. Just, I'm just telling you, it was very beautiful. That's that's what I want to tell you. <laughs> Sam's very kindly agreed to like uh, take any questions. Like we've got a wee bit of time, and then there's some some more uh, drinks and some food. We've got a wee bit of food for everybody because we don't want to be drinking on empty stomachs, do we? <laughs> so, um, but should we have a wee seat, yeah, Sam? Maybe exactly. just to. I've got like obviously like a million questions, but I just I wonder if anyone. Such a classic thing to state at the start of a Q&A. <laughs> like, I've got a million questions, but does anyone else have a question? Cool. Hi, Sam. Thank you so, so much for an, a, a really beautiful and really interesting talk. Um, it really struck me that you were discussing in the beginning sort of these loss, horror, into schisms, into gaps almost, gaps in history, mm -hmm. like the ahistoricism, the kids don't know history now, right? There's gaps in our knowledge, there's what we choose to keep and what we choose to discard. And I'm really intrigued because you also showed the Nan Golden piece which has people like Greer Langton, Peter Hujar, 
Wojnarowicz, um, and how much collage for you is a really useful tool um, in thinking about what we can do with spaces given and not given, because more happens in the space between than mm -hmm. it does on either side yeah. in collage. And your work really resonated with me as someone who works on collage, um, that there's so much richness in the space between and the things that you didn't say, mm -hmm. and where you let other people's words fill for you. And I just wonder if you can talk at all to collage as a, as a methodology or, or a way of thinking for you. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that that space in between that you mentioned is kind of is where i think of most of the work as kind is the space i think that the work inhabits so like when teachers first came out and then kind of six months after it first came out and we were going outside again and i was having actual conversations with people about the book um i would have some people come up to me and say this is a personal essay and other people come up to me and say this is a long narrative poem so it's kind of, it's always been like that space in between and in terms of using other people's words um I think sometimes it's okay to admit that someone else said it better than you, which is very much like, so with the clip from The Inherence, when I was looking over it, when I was putting the slides together, I was like, I could find a place to cut it, but it's really good and I just want to play it all. And I think it, it also plays into like what I think is interesting about history and like how we carry it with us. And for me, you know, it's kind of carried in the book. And so the citations are important both as kind of records of a cultural history, but also for me, I like to foreground the process of making the thing. I find it quite interesting and potentially helpful for people. Like I'll have people, when people have responded to the book, which people do generously and even now two years after it's come out, which I didn't expect, um, they'll say, I read it and then I went and read these other things that were in it. And for me, that's kind of the dream response to the book is for it to be able to like, pay it forward and help remind people of that history. Does anyone else have a question you want to ask? Hi. Thank you. Um, thanks for a really lovely talk. It was fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, your writing's really beautiful and seems um, almost it's, it's not overly uh, polished is maybe the wrong word <laughs> but but you know what I mean it's it's obviously very thought out and beautiful and kind of um yeah created very carefully and I'm just just this image that's projected I'm wondering if if you've got any kind of particular methodology in terms of like how you decide what um effect you want things to have and how that relates to the kind of like messiness and the griminess mm -hmm. of um, queer histories, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think so. Um, for me, that's something that kind of, it always begins with like form for me. I don't know so if your like, microphone's on, Sam. Is it not? Um, oh, 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 no, no. It's a okay. Yeah, I think it's uh, me positioning. I'll tell you what, I can unplug this and just kind of hold it to my mouth now. Um, how, does this sound okay? Okay, um, and for me, I think it's like a formal thing, like especially for something like teachers, which is so about that history that I think capturing the recording of it is important, whereas compared to the new book that came out um, in the summer, it's been a very long year, um, <laughs> that came out about six months ago, um, it's more kind of traditionally a poetry collection and because it has these other concerns about like mass media and reality TV, it's kind of designed to almost be like the literary equivalent of channel surfing. So it's like the, the citations are there, but they're smaller, they're more clipped, they're less drawn out because it's a, the form means that it's about something different. And when it, whenever I work on something new, I'm uh, threatening to do a novel uh, next year. Um, and the first question is always like a formal one of like, what does doing a book of poetry, a book like my first one, or a novel kind of allow me to do. I hope that's some kind of answer that's a little helpful. <laughs> Any other questions? I've got a question, maybe, Well, other people think. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, I'm like floating <laughs> around this space, like this microphone. Um, 
I I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, queer read this at the ICA because you said something quite interesting about was it right place right time or like yeah, luck? Right place right time. Um, and I think a lot about these sort of <laughs> the importance of these spaces or the emergence of or the re-emergence of these spaces for for queer trans and non-binary writers or practitioners or artists to like come together. Um, and I guess you're sort of like how you maybe a wee bit more on like how you feel about that space. I think a lot about Lucas Hildebrand wrote a really beautiful essay called Retroactivism and talks about watching a James Wentzie documentary and actually the sort of political power of being kind of in a room with a bunch of other queers watching something about like sort of queer history and that sort of in itself having a kind of activation I don't know that I'm kind of like preloading yeah, no, that question um, for you. Like, no, but <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to pick up directly. Is it that? Yes. I'm going to pick up. It kind of is. I'm going to pick up directly where that leaves off. And it is like an activation thing because like I'd been in London for like a month or slightly less. Um, and like I, I basically I moved there like for work, quote unquote, as if I have a real job um, because so much of like writing and freelancing is all London based. So I knew I kind of had to be there in order to get to do it as a job. And it was like, well, what? It was this kind of sense of what can I go to? Where can I find a thing that I can't? I hesitate to use safe space, not because I don't think it's a useful term in general, but because I don't think it's useful for this. Um, but it, it was that sense of activation because I was like, I was between working out how I wanted to write. I'd kind of just finished my master's and I'd gone off my thesis, um, which may happen to people here, um, at which point you have my sympathy and solidarity. Um, <laughs> and and I went to that and like mostly because I saw that Dodie was reading there and I just read When the Sick Rule the World um, and Isabel also read there. They read from um, what's one? We Are Made of Diamond Stuff, the one that came before Sterling Carrot Gold. Um, and it was just really interesting to me because I saw a bunch of people doing work that I'd never really encountered before. I didn't really know how to do. And it was kind of that light bulb moment of, oh, you can kind of do what you want. It was, it was like a really freeing moment of like, you can do what you want and you will be able to find an audience for it. And I'm again, trying to pay that forward now because I'm doing like a trans non-binary reading series with a friend of mine in London. So again, for me, it's all about trying to like keep these traditions going. Cause like, and like, I'm, I'm like this as a freelance writer as well. I hate, I'd hate to pull a ladder up behind me like mm. I've, I've been very fortunate and I think it would be churlish to put it mildly for me to not kind of offer that to other people yeah lovely beautiful um does anyone else have any other questions you want to ask um come on Jonathan. thank you thanks I really enjoyed your words. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you quoted a little phrase about um, the heart uh, not needing fixed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read the full text and uh, sort of having a religious Christian connotation. Uh, and uh, I wondered why you chose that uh, piece and this one here, yeah. yeah and uh, if there's more about that and, you know I'm thinking as well that you know we have so many uh, parts of the university here uh, one of our volunteers is uh, the associate deputy vice chaplain uh, and uh, we're always interested in you know intersections and uh, that jumped out at me uh, as another one yeah, um, I can I can attempt to talk about it because <laughs> I'm I'm not like a person of faith myself. The thing that really kind of, but I've been kind of thinking a lot about it, like the language of it and um, how it does intersect with queerness. I've also been watching uh, Midnight Mass, which is an interesting thing about religion, um, and it just struck me as something that I think 
I, I mean, first of all, I like that it's subversive because you do have like a lot of specific connotations with like how people assume that religion and queerness uh, intersect. And I just, I also think that like the language of community and like of, of salvation and whatever that looks like is very important. And there is a weird kind of religious language to a lot of queerness. Like you think a lot of queer spaces like clubs called heaven or whatever. And it's really interesting that that's kind of there. And it's just like really interesting to me. It's like it's there under the surface and it becomes like that, um, a version of that space. And I think that is, especially like a poem like this, which exists, is placed in that space. Um, it has the potential to be quite, I think, freeing for people. Like, I guess is my answer. I feel like I'm bad at answering questions because I talk in circles a lot. No, I think you're doing wonderful. Really oh, cool. <laughs> Just on the whole notion of like, so the the queer with the capitalization of H E obviously is a reference to Jesus mm -hmm. at the gay bar, but there's a long history of reading queerness into the body of Christ that goes back into the medieval point. So Sophie Sexton, for example, has just written a piece on trans and non-binary identity in the Bible, and looking at like the wound of Christ being mistaken for the vagina of the mother, uh, and the Madonna, and how there's these religious rubbings where it was frottaged away basically. <laughs> Um, and then they use this as a, so there is a, this long trajectory back into, art historian in the room, sorry artists. <laughs> um, there is this long trajectory back into the medieval past of queerness and the reading of, of religious bodies is queer and that bodies like angels are supposedly non-gendered, even though we started referring to them as he later, um, that comes around with the translation, particularly with the King James Bible in particular. But there is this non-binary transness, um, trans, sending boundaries that's happening in religion for a long time. And I think our notion of queerness, we're so bound up in 21st century ideas and we think that we invented queerness, but actually <laughs> it's way, way older. And I think it's such a beautiful piece because actually what it says is that the if you believe in what the Bible actually teaches, which is Christ's love is, is you know, knows no bounds, then actually Jesus at the gay bar makes total sense because he cups the hand of anyone who comes to him and, and believes in it. I'm not a believer myself, I'm not a religious person, but I think the actual, the message behind it is what you were saying about community mm -hmm. being so important and the religious aspect of community being a binding thing, um, which doesn't happen in the AIDS activism in the UK and the US in the 80s, but is happening in Germany, interestingly, with the campaign called Sus, um, Positive Zusammenleben, Living Together Positively. Um, so just as a kind of, maybe there's something there for you to kind of, or everyone to think about that it's cultural context is also maybe important here, but um, yeah, sorry, comment over. Okay. Art historian <laughs> in the room. See, this is what I mean. Sometimes other people say it better than me. Yeah, <laughs> every day is a school day at uh, the University of Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> We're all here learning. Um, does anyone have a final thing? I think what I would suggest, unless it's a burning, burning question, um, that there's some food. I mean, I think there's actually enough for like a sandwich each, <laughs> which, is, and a, maybe a wee couscous salad. So, um, mil life. I'm not joking. Yet. Milk, milk of kindly, milk of kindly. We paid them. Uh, milk of <laughs> catered tonight. So we've got some nice food and some drinks at the back. So if you want to hang on for a little bit, and then Sophia, um, w remind me whereabouts is this staff student solidarity thing? Do you want to bring the poster? So, student housing co op. Thirty four rights house. Okay. Like Moses part in the Red Sea, I'll, I'll lead <laughs> a group of people to the staff student solidarity fundraiser. <laughs> Beautiful. So, people can. So we can have a wee sandwich here and go get a dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying to me. Okay, I love it. Um, okay, everyone, I just want to sort of say, uh, again, a huge thank you to Sam for 
being so so generous and thoughtful in this invitation. It's not an easy invitation, actually. I think sometimes when someone's like, hello, I'm from the University of Edinburgh, and I would like you to do a lecture. I think I said lecture at first of all, and you were yeah. like, I was like that sounds I've never done that before. Serious and yeah. like official, and but not like how I write. <laughs> But you've been so <laughs> yeah exactly, <laughs> and then I was like, but we're in a, we're in art school, so it's fine. Don't worry about it, Owen. So, but you've been so kind and so like wonderful, and that was just such a beautiful way of reflecting on on practice and thinking through. And I think you know I, I like I talk to a lot of students about writing here and try to get folk to think about it because I teach the writing bit, the boring part of the art degree. Um, and I try to get people to engage with it. And I think you're such a sort of like, it's such a wonderful example of the ways in which you can engage with writing as practice. And I hope for any students that are in the room, if you come tomorrow, you have this really nice opportunity to spend some time with Sam and sort of talk in a less like pressured, here's a roving mic situation. <laughs> so let's thank Sam again and uh, <laughs> thanks everyone thank you